Sing to me of the man, Muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hollowed heights of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. Many plains he suffered, heartsick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster. Hard as he strove, the recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. The blind fools, they devoured the cattle of the sun, and the sun god blotted out the day of their return. Launch out on his story, muse, daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will sing for our time, too. All right, and that quote there is the beginning of our next book, and it is The Odyssey. Yes. We have finished off with the Iliad. Last time we saw it, it was Hector getting his fi- or his funeral after he went rolling with Achilles every now and then. Yep. And we're pretty excited about this. This is before this, we actually haven't read the full book in its entirety. Probably just English yeah. class. Yeah, so, neither one of us. So this is going to be new for us as well, kind of. I mean, you know, it's it's going to be pretty new. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be. I mean, there's like, what did we read? Like, I mean, four, well, well, we know the mythology. Yeah, we just haven't read. It's the like we read like probably four chat, like four of the books, like the Cyclops and Scylla and yep. Calypso, because Calypso. Yep. What can you do? Yeah, what can you do? <laughs> Odysseus found out what he could do. Yep. Numerous times. Indeed. He did. In I, front of his pigmen. I'm agreeing with you. I, I agree. <laughs> All right. So there's a couple of things that I want to go into before we get into the actual uh, Odyssey, because there, there's a big gap there. Dustin yes. actually taught me something because I thought it was 20 years. It's 10 years between the Iliad and the Odyssey. And there's a bunch of books that unfortunately never survived but they the the ancients make sure that we know that they were nowhere near the the same type of uh the same um tier as what the odyssey or homer's uh iliad were so we didn't lose out on much but there's a couple things that the book expects us to realize so in the the rest of the the characters they all either get their demise or they have their homecoming because this this book is It's a book of homecomings. So there's a a Greek word, it's called nostos. And with nostos, it's just their way of wrapping up what they've gone through. And in the time frame that, heck, or at the end of the Iliad that's happened since is Achilles, um, he gets killed by Paris by getting shot in the foot, not the heel, the Mm -hmm. foot. Thank you very much. Hits that artery. Hits the artery. The toe artery. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't really know what part of the foot it was. It could be the heel still, but it wasn't because he's he's weak in the heel. Okay, guys. Yeah, that was that's different. <laughs> yeah, and then so then there's there's another book that's the the little Iliad. Um, it talks about right after Achilles' death and the sack of Troy. Um, so right after Achilles is is killed, I've talked about this a little bit. They have a a debate over who should get the armor. Um, they let the men decide. So it's between Aos or Ajax, the greater and um odysseus and the men vote and they pick odysseus and ajax he doesn't take that very well he ends up getting mad and slaying a bunch of goats um and then wakes up and realizes that he messed up and killed a bunch of goats and in his shame committed suicide not because he killed the goats but because he failed at killing the men that didn't pick him because Mm -hmm. rational human beings would operate like that and so the reason why that's kind of a why he got so mad though is the army was saying, we respect a man that is more cunning and conniving and a weaselly, because that's that's probably the best way to explain Odysseus, is he's a little bit of a weasel. Yeah. Like, he's a weasel he that is. you love, but if you didn't have him on your side, he'd be a weasel that you hated. You're like, oh, what yeah. are you? you often, he'd be a thorn in yeah. your side. Yep, definitely. But Ajax is a superior yeah. fighter. Yep, he is masculinity. Ooh, what a man. Yeah. So He's big, strong, and knows how to fight. Yeah, everything that should be the he ideals. He Hector a couple times. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, made him shake in his boots. Yeah. They're like, Hector, we need you over here. And he's like, yeah, you know what? Actually, what if I didn't? Yeah, what if actually, I fought over like, here I and lived? A rock, and it about killed me. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm out. Yeah, you guys go do it. And then the rest of the book talks about how they built the Trojan horse um, to get into Troy, the most common I, or the most common element of the the Trojan War which was obviously Ili- or Odysseus's idea. I almost said Iliad's idea. <laughs> and then right after which, there is um, a book that I can't pronounce. <laughs> um, it overlapped a little bit with that book, um, and it talks about the 
the similar part of the the tra- or the the destruction of Troy, but it goes into more detail of the atrocities that the the Greeks ended up uh, doing. So there were three <clears throat> key elements that that cause what happens in the Odyssey. So no one gets to go home on a normal, timely manner because of what happens here. And and the three main ones that I want to point out is Achilles' son Neoptol- or Neoptolemus. He killed Priam at his uh, altar. So. Priam went to go hide and hold on to the statue. And I talked about this a little bit on previous ones where when you're at the altar and you're at that altar's mercy, you're supposed to be protected by the gods, at least in that spot. There were ways around it. You could pull them away from it. You could do other things. But he's like, nope, I'm going to kill him right here. Now, you're probably thinking, Achilles is pretty young. How could he have a man of fighting age as a son? Don't worry about it. Doesn't make sense. We know. Um, (laughs) Don't poke holes. Yeah, don't poke holes. This is obviously not Homer that wrote this one. So it, it makes sense. Um, and then there's the part where um, Ast- uh, Astyanax, it's a tough one, Astyanax, the son of Hector, he gets thrown from the walls of Troy and dashed upon the rocks because they couldn't, uh, they decided that it was far too scary to have the son of Hector, the great fighter, grow up to possibly seek revenge. So they decided to get rid of that real quick. And then the person that wasn't talked about a whole lot, I asked the lesser, he ended up raping Cassandra, and for those of you guys who have been constant listeners, Cassandra was the the woman that tricked Apollo into giving her the the gift of prophecy, and then goes, "Actually, you know what? We're not we're not doing this whole banging thing." And he goes, "Oh, great! No one will believe you either." <laughs> <clears throat> so she was at one of the altars of Athena, and he decided to rape her. Mm-hmm. And as anyone knows, Athena is very forgiving about things like this happening oh, in her yeah, temples. Yeah. Ask Medusa. She loves it. <laughs> so I asked the, the lesser. He doesn't have a good story. He doesn't have a happy ending. He dies out at sea. He doesn't really get his return. And then there's a book called the Nostoi or Returns so that goes hand in hand with Nostos. Um, that tells the story of the rest of the, the remaining heroes. Um, Agamemnon, we talked about, he gets killed by his wife, Clytemnestra. That's in this book. Um, we'll go into that. We'll go into that. And that's a key element in this book. And I'll explain a little bit at the end of this, this episode, why that's driven home so much. Menelaus and Helen, they're driven off course. Um, they spend several years in Egypt. It's, it's weird. Um, and then obviously, like I said, I asked lesser in this book gets, gets killed out out there. And then the only one that doesn't get his homecoming is Odysseus. And I don't know if it's because, the Odyssey was written beforehand and they didn't need it. Or Homer goes, you know what? Odysseus deserves his. So let's give it to him. Um, and that's kind of where this kind of kicks off. Now, a lot of people, they, they kind of hate on the first four books of the Odyssey because something that Dustin and I didn't realize, and we talked about this a little bit, is how weird it is that this book starts off not with Odysseus, the key character, but with his son. And yeah. it's already been 10 years. It's actually almost the time when Odysseus is going to return. It starts off with the gods talking about getting him home. Like, you know what? He was good. He was a, he was a pretty good guy. Yeah. Let's send him home. So that part was kind of strange, but there, there's, a, there's a key point to it. And it's the same thing that we talked about in the Iliad to further the drama. Just like Homer could have started the Iliad with all of us seeing that, you know, the, the Trojan War with Helen getting taken from Sparta which, by the way, is about 20 miles from the shore. So um, Paris, to, to just to let you see just how much more of a frat boy he is, because they won't <laughs> let me say the other word on this podcast, guys. <laughs> Completely censored. How much of a frat boy he is. He took wagons full of all of Menelaus's, uh money and his wife 20 miles to get to the sea. Mm-hmm. Just no big deal. He's a sneaky snake. He's a sneaky snake. He's a frat boy. <laughs> so just like that, this part here is to just to, to build it up. So all of these books, they call it the, the Telemachy because it's uh, his son. Um, these books are just to kind of let you see what's mostly at stake here. We're already seeing what, what's happening in this whole world that Odysseus has been gone. Because keep in mind, Odysseus took all of the fighting men. So this is a civilization where... The only men that were left behind were the young boys who weren't yet at fighting age and too young and the strong or the older men. Obviously, the older men would have died by now. So this is an entire generation of men who didn't have their fathers there to keep them in check. 
and we'll kind of see what happens here. You know, there's stunted growth. There's a bunch of bunch of just bad apples. Angst. Yeah, angst and just some naughty boys. Yeah. Okay, rude. Pardon my language, but naughty boys. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it really kind of sets the stage. Yes. Okay, and then let me get into it. A key th- bunch of key themes I want you guys to look into while Dustin reads here. So. We've got nature versus the versus civilization. We'll see that later on, mostly with what Odysseus goes through. There's male versus female. Um, you're going to see it with what type of characters the females always are in this book. There's the the stasis versus movement. So when when Odysseus is stuck in one spot and not moving around, like when he's isolated on Calypso's island, um, there is the truth or the real intentions versus deception which with a weasel um odysseus you're going to see that a lot and also like i said growing up without the father so these are very key elements that we're going to see in this book um and try to as dustin reads it out just try to see if you catch some of those and then the final part that i want to talk about before i hand it off and i know this is a little bit longer of an intro and i apologize is this is the whole book focuses mainly on Xenia, which I talked about a little bit in the episode where Glaucus and, um, gosh, I can't think of that. Diomedes. I, can, I don't know how I forgot Diomedes' name, which actually right. I don't have in my notes what happened to him. I'll have to look that up and figure out what happened to him for us here. Cause I don't, it says in book two, uh, Nestor says that he made it home. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Okay. I didn't have that in my notes. So I was like, wait a minute. Just thought about that. Diomedes, we need to, we're going to, you know, we're going to ghost write a book for Diomedes. I like that. <laughs> the Diomed. <laughs> it's got a nice ring to it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So Zania, um, and I actually, I realized that I probably didn't do as good of a job on it. So I went and I looked up and I tried to find the best way that I could find that it's explained. And I found it, it's uh, Professor Vandiver. So here's the best way that I could put it. So when it comes to Zania... When men were traveling from one polis to another or city, keep in mind that this is a man's world and the Iliad and the Odyssey. I'm not trying to be sexist, but that's how this worked here. So apart from Athena, who is masquerading as a man in this book, there's only men that travel. So they, they travel from one place to the next. While they're traveling, there's no hotels. There's no Airbnbs. There's nothing like that that they can go and check themselves into. So what they had was a system and it's not a law, it's not a set of rules in place, it's just an expectation and an agreement. So much so that they put Zeus, the god of all gods, in charge of it. So when you make an affront to Xenia, you make an affront to Zeus. Now, Xenia, it's harder to translate. There's five different words for it. And some of the, let me see if I can, if I've got it in my notes here. The, the main parts are, it, it can be translated into English as guest, stranger, foreigner um i can't remember the more of those natures so outsider out, i think outsider yeah um and then host so uh. so when this word is used it, it could mean so many different things in the english language so it was a it was almost like a verbal contract so what you would do you would go in and you would find a house of someone of similar stature to you so if you're a poor vagabond you're not going to go to the palace and expect them to take you in because they won't that would be that would be an insult you find the house of someone of similar station in their society as you are. And you would sit down, they would feed you, they won't talk to you yet, they let you eat your food, because the second rule is you don't ask them what their name is because or until they're finished eating. And the main reason for that is if they don't know what your name is, they can't deny you. It, uh, you're right. So they're making sure that you get your food first. And then, you know, if someone wants to take the wrath of Zeus, whatever. But some people were like, you know what? What if we make sure we take away the temptation first? Then they would stay the night. Um, it, it was intended to be more reciprocal. So you wouldn't stay long. You would stay the night um, and then you would be on your way. You could stay multiple nights if your business needed to or if whatever affairs you needed to do. But you weren't expected to stay for very long. And you were expected if you were able if you could afford it or able, you would give them a gift. Then in the Iliad or the in the Odyssey, you would get bathed randomly by their daughters. So that's kind of strange. That but does happen. Yeah, it does happen. It does happen. And it's not just because Odysseus is a Mac. He is, but it's not just because of that. 
From then on, the minute you cross that threshold, though, the minute you walk into their their house as a guest, you become a friend. Now, it's important to note that you're not a friend by our standard, a friend. You're just considered a friend that they could call upon later. And when I say that it's reciprocal, it's it's not that necessarily they'll come and expect you to reciprocate to them necessarily, that you will be who they seek out in that city, but it's because they realize that they're doing this because they know that either in the future or in the past, they've had this perfect contract. They've had it working out. So they know that even though they're having to go through the the awkwardness and the annoyance of a guest, that they've also had and reaped the uh, the benefits to this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> kind of pay it forward kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Pay it forward or back pay. Yep. <laughs> yep. So that, that's the main thing that I wanted to explain. And I realized, like I said, I, I did not explain it as well as it could be. And I wanted to make sure that we go into it because books one through four are mainly about this. This is this is kind of a, a key element to the story. And you can't really understand the anger of um, Telemachus unless you know this part. Because, yeah, I mean, it, it is kind of a nuisance when you're reading it that... Yeah, these people are staying longer than they should, but you don't realize that how against their their society this was, because in, in the back of your mind, you're wondering, well, you know, maybe they just, you know, his court, they would do this type of thing. But no, he, he makes sure that you know for a fact that this is not normal. And that's all I had. Take it away, Dustin. All righty. So jumping into book one, like you said earlier, the, the, uh, the start of the book takes place 10 years after the fall of Troy. So at this point, Odysseus has been gone 20 years, roughly. And the book starts out kind of reveal. It pretty much reveals where Odysseus is. He's not dead. He's actually stuck on an Island, a remote Island with the goddess Calypso who is in love with him and won't let him go. The name of the Island is called, Ogigia. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Wild name, but that's that's what they call it. That's so that's where Odysseus is right now. He's not at home like everybody else. He is trapped on an island with a goddess that won't let him go because she is in love with him. And then after that is revealed, it immediately cuts to Zeus up in Olympus, you know, with all the gods around him, and he Odysseus isn't even isn't even on his mind right now. He's thinking of Agamemnon. He's talking about, he's he's pretty much like, oh, mankind blame the gods, but it's all their fault. Like, Agamemnon gets killed by his wife and her lover, uh, Aegisthus, Aegisthus, and, you know, they blame us. No, it's all them. And he's ranting and raving about Agamemnon and Clytemnestra and uh, Aegisthus. And finally, Athena steps in, and she kind of, she's, she's a little bit harsh with her reply to Zeus's inquiries about this. And she says, our father, son of Kronos, most high above all rulers, that man assuredly lies in befitting ruin. So perish all who do such deeds. Yes. Is my heart distressed for wise Odysseus, hapless man who long cut off from friends is meeting hardship upon a sea encircled Island, the navel of the sea. Woody the Island is, and there a goddess dwells daughter of evil-minded Atlas, who knows the depths of every sea and through his power holds the tall pillars uh, firm which keeps earth and sky asunder. It is his daughter who detains this hapless, sorrowing man, ever with tender and insistent words enticing him to forgetfulness of Ithaca. And still, Odysseus, through longing once to see the smoke of his native land, would gladly die. Nevertheless, your heart turns not, Olympian one, did not Odysseus pay you honor by the Argive ships and offer sacrifices on the plain of Troy? Why then are you so wrathful with him, Zeus? So she's pretty much like, hey, forget about Agamemnon, what's going on? What about Odysseus? He has been loyal and he's made sacrifices. He's done everything you wanted of him. And he right now is suffering on an island. And you don't care at all. Like, what? what's up? What do you do to, to incite your wrath? What's the deal? Well, Zeus, he's quick to defend himself on this. He's like, oh, it's not me. It's Poseidon. <laughs> like, it's my brother Poseidon. He is relentless in his pursuit 
of ruining Odysseus. He doesn't wish to kill him. He just wants to put him through hell and back pretty much. And the reason being is apparently Odysseus and his crew stopped at this island. Well, this island was the home of Poseidon's Cyclops son. And he captured the crew, kept him in a little cave, and was eating them. You know, one a day, whatever. And Odysseus came up with the idea to fashion pretty much a giant shiv and drop it into his eye, blinding him. And when he when Odysseus does this and escapes with, you know, his crew, Poseidon's son is like, you know, curse Odysseus because he hears Odysseus's name and curses him. And Poseidon's like, all right, I got you, son. You're blind. I'll help you out. So he has been sending Odysseus just off course on a wily journey. And Zeus is like, yeah, so it's not my fault. It's Poseidon. But you're right. Enough's enough. <laughs> he has had his proper share of misfortune. Yeah, he's like, yeah, yeah. Enough's enough. In, in Poseidon's defense, though, the Cyclops didn't even know his name, Odysseus. He convinced him his name is Nobody. Yeah. But as yeah. he's as they're sailing away, he's like, and you could tell everyone who asks that you just got hit by Odysseus. Yeah, Odysseus <laughs> Odysseus uh, puffed his chest out yep. there and was like, yeah, you tell everyone Odysseus blinded you. Wily Odysseus. And then that's when uh, the Cyclops is like, hey, Dad, Odysseus blinded me. Teach him a lesson. Yeah. And that's what's been happening. So... Zeus comes up, he's like, okay, we need to come up with a plan to have Odysseus escape and return home to Ithaca. So, Athena says that she will inform Hermes to tell Calypso that she needs to release Odysseus. In the meantime, she is going to go help his son, Telemachus. Now, Telemachus is not having a good time either. No. Right now, his dad's been gone 10 years, 20 years in total. He's straight up not having a good time. Yeah, 20 years in total. And he wasn't even born yet when Odysseus left. He was in his mom's womb. So he has never met his father. And by now, he's a 20-year-old man. And all pretty much every young guy in Ithaca that didn't go to war is pursuing Penelope, his mother, Odysseus' wife. They want her in marriage. And they have taken over his home. They have moved in. They're pretty much squatting. Mm -hmm. They're violating the sanctity of Xenia. Yeah, they all have moved into the palace. They're constantly eating his food. They're they're just helping themselves, taking everything in the constant pursuit to woo Penelope. While eating his grapes and going, yeah, I'm going to rail your mom. Yeah. That's going to be mine. You're going to call me daddy. Yeah, they're all talking smack to him. Yeah. And he's just like, he, he, so he is not having a good yeah. time right now. Not a good time. So Athena's plan is to go help him. And she goes down and she takes the form of one of Odysseus's old friends. And his name, I believe, is uh, Minta. Uh, it's Mentor. No, Mentor's uh, later. Mentor's later, yep. You're yeah, right. You're this right. is a different guy. Let's see here. I think you're right. I'm just I'm just double checking to make sure Mintis. Mintis, I'm sorry. yeah, yeah. Mintis. Somebody, yeah. Mint. She likes that name. Yeah, Mint. Mint is uh, something. Yeah, anything with mint. Yeah. <laughs> so she takes the guise of Mintis, who's an old friend of Odysseus, like I said, and she goes to speak with uh, Telemachus. Now, when she's a, when she arrives in the palace, there's a huge feast going on, and there's a bard singing songs of the men coming home from Troy. Tragically, I should say. Now, she comes up to Telemachus and, you know, she kind of introduces himself. Hey, I'm an old friend of your dad, this and that. And Telemachus, he leans toward, t- towards her. You know, she's in disguise as a man. He leans towards her and kind of whispers to her so no one else will hear. He's like, good stranger, will you feel offense at what I say? These things are all their care, the harp and song. An easy care when making no amends. They eat the substance of a man whose white bones now are rotting in the rain. If lying on the land or in the sea, the waters roll them around. Yet were they once to see him coming home to Ithaca, they all would pray rather for speed of foot than stores of golden clothing. But he instead, by some hard fate, is gone, and naught remains to us of comfort. No. Not if any man on earth shall say he still will come. Past is his day of coming. 
But now declare me this and plainly tell, who are you, of what people, where is your town and kindred, on what ship did you come, and how did sailors bring you to Ithaca, whom did they call themselves? For I am sure you did not come on foot, and tell me truly this, that I may know full well if for the first time now you visit here or are my father's friend. For many foreigners once sought our home, because Odysseus also was a rover among men. Now he's confiding into this complete stranger that claims to be his father's friend. And it's just it's just kind of a heart wrenching scene because he's just like, This this is my life. What can I do about it? Like Look at how they frolic. Yeah, look at this. They, they have not a care in the world, yet we're here suffering. It's ridiculous. Well, Athena in the guise of Mentis, she tells him that she does not believe Odysseus is dead. She's like, I don't think I don't you know what? I don't think your dad is dead. And something tells me he won't be absent long from home. You know, she's got a hunch. Yep. <laughs> and then she asks what the feast is for, pretty much. And Telemachus explains it's the sc- in so many words he says it's the scumbag suitors. He's like, all these guys want to marry my mom. And they're robbing from us and, you know, just squatting, like I said earlier. Now, this answer does not sit well with Athena. She's not mad at Telemachus. She's mad at the situation. She's mad at what they're doing. She is very upset. And she she tells Telemachus to call an assembly the next morning and announce the suitor's banishment. Like, hey, call a meeting tomorrow morning. Tell these guys to get out or else. (laughs) Well, you know, tell him he's, he's only 20 years yeah. old. And he's never once had to do this. This is, all, yeah, this this is an awful is, lot to ask. Yeah. Like, if, this, if that's all I had to do, I would have done that. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Great. So, you know, obviously he doesn't feel comfortable with this. Well, her being a goddess, she inspires, you know, a little bit of courage into him. And you know, so he prepares for the next day. Hits him with a little Jedi mind trick. Exactly. Now, she also tells... Telemachus, that he needs to prepare to make a journey to Pyrrhos and Sparta to learn of Odysseus' fate from either Nestor or Menelaus. Nestor resides in Pyrrhos, Menelaus, and Sparta. And then after that, Athena takes her leave. But Telemachus, is, he, he, he's, not, he's not stupid. He's got his dad's cunning. You know, he realizes, he's like, you know what? I don't think that was one of my dad's friends. Pretty sure that was a god. It's probably because the way I'm picturing this is a lot like in the life of Brian, where the women <laughs> are dressed up like the man with the fake beards. That's probably what happened. He's like, I don't, I don't think that's a real man. Yeah, I'm not buying it. <laughs> I'm pretty confident that was Athena. Yep, something fishy's going <laughs> <wrong> on here. <laughs> so then, Telemachus encounters his mom Penelope, who is upset by the bard's songs of men not returning from Troy. And she wants him to stop singing or get him to sing something else. Well, this is in this part of the book, you kind of see, you see a change, but you know, you don't really know Telemachus, but you know, it's a change because he immediately shuts his mom down. He's like, Hey, you're not, we're not the only one who, who had someone not come back from Troy. A lot of people did not come back. So you're just going to have to deal with it. The bard singing, it is what it is. If you don't like it, you know, he puts it pretty bluntly. He's like, if you don't like it, stay out of the men's quarters and just return to your chamber. Let me handle your affairs. I'll take care of it. You got to trust me. And that takes you completely off guard. So that kind of shows you that that's not right. something he would normally do. Perfectly so, executed. Yeah. Yeah. So he is making a growth already and he's just been introduced pretty much. Now, <laughs> Next, he gives the suitors notice about what's going to happen tomorrow, which is kind of interesting. Why even call an assembly? Because yeah. he's like, hey, tomorrow I'm going to have assembly. I'm going to tell you guys to get out. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a warning. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, yeah, I don't know. So I don't know the point of the assembly the next morning because yeah. he tells them what he needs to say pretty much. Like, hey, we're, ge- we're meeting up tomorrow morning. I'm telling you to get out. So I want it to be a fair battle, but I'm going to blast you. Yeah. So sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tuck you in. Now, two particularly defiant suitors named uh, Antinius and Eurymachus. And the- Antinius, his name literally means uh, mindless one, so, <laughs> which makes, makes sense because of uh, what he says. But. Yeah. 
They ask for the identity of the stranger that he was speaking to earlier because they're like, well, he must have told him something. You know, when when did he learn to chime up like that? And Telemachus is just like, oh, it was just an old friend of my dad. Yep. Mind your business. Don't pretty worry. Much. Don't worry about it. I'm, this is a, this is an assembly for me to tell you get out. Yeah. Okay. And that is how book one concludes. All right. He's getting a little bit in there. He's he's. He's getting his getting his strut on. Yep. You know? Yep. One a couple Putting things. On I, his big boy pants. A couple things I wanted to to point out. So I talked a little bit about it at, in the intro about how you know that this shows what is happening. You know what's at stake for Odysseus. So with this part, we see that things have come to a complete head here. It's been ten years. It's starting to become far longer than any reasonable person can be expected to fight this off. So. We have two key characters here. We have Penelope, and she's caught in a very, very hard position. Penelope is hard to not sympathize with because she has two duties, both of which are contradicting what she should do. In the Greek world, as a wife, she's expected to stay completely loyal to uh, to her husband. So she can't go and marry someone else. But then also as a woman in the Greek world, there's no place for an unmarried woman. So she, by not remarrying and waiting it out, is going against what her role in society is but then also as the the wife of the king she is expected to once the son comes of age hand off the keys to the kingdom yeah and what's kind of hilarious about this complete asinine idea that the the suitors have is they think that somehow by pursuing and hooking up with penelope they're going to yeah they're going to be king and sidestep uh uh, Telemachus, and I'm assuming it's because of how um, how passive he's been. They're like, oh, he won't even see it coming. But then they're like, okay, who's this guy? Yeah, hold up. So <laughs> then there's Telemachus. He's also they're they're both kind of in the stasis because they can't further their growth. He can't become what he's destined to be. He can't become the new king of Ithaca because they haven't moved on. They haven't decided what to do. So his mom hasn't handed over the keys to the kingdom. He can't be take over the affairs of. Uh, of Ithaca so he's not having his growth and that, that's part of the the key element here so you notice Athena knows where Odysseus is she could just tell him but she's yeah. not because she realizes that he's not he's not who he should be she sees in the way that he broke the code for his Aenea. that's why I talked about you wait till that she sees that he's he's not being purposely rude he just he hasn't had a chance to flourish so yeah. the first thing she has him do is go out into the real world to experience Aenea because that will help him grow as a man. And it's kind of a cool point to see because we we talked about how this doesn't start in like the normal way. This is probably where most shows get their idea. So when I when I'm reading this book, I think a lot about how TV shows work or how soap operas work or how just movies work where you you get you see one scene and then later on when we go to Odysseus, it's going to be happening at the same exact time but it's not going to be on the same page. Then later on in the books, we'll see uh, a flashback. So with how old this book is, we have to kind of uh, kind of imagine until we can see further proof that this is probably one of the first times that something like this has been executed, and not just executed, but executed in such a brilliant way. So he completely uses this brand new style of this is happening in point A, this is happening in point B, this is what's at stake. And he's going to use that further on with Agamemnon. We've already had it mentioned once already, and I, I believe that it, he's been, it's been mentioned 13 times in all the books about Agamemnon's homecoming. And because what's happening is it's telling you another time what's at stake for Odysseus. What happens if Penelope does decide to marry? What if she does have a new lover? And what happened to Agamemnon? Agamemnon is everything wrong with the homecoming. So... Odysseus needs to get his butt in gear. He needs to get out of that place because if he doesn't get back soon, she might remarry. They might have an heir of their own. Their son might be cast aside. He has to get this going. Yeah. And it's perfectly executed. Exactly. And I know I say this all the time, but Jesus, Homer is a genius. Yeah. For something, he gets it in. For something this old. And also, something that you have to keep in mind, these books are probably only performed four hours at a time. So the first four books are probably that part. So that's probably why it takes that transition. So then on book four, we'll finally, or book five, we'll finally get to Odysseus. 
And people are like, oh, yeah, I forgot. We haven't heard about him yet. <laughs> right. And then they're going to transition. So they, he keeps them at the edge of their seat. I can't imagine how how mad you were, would be to go home on day one. Like, okay, I didn't even hear one thing about Odysseus. So shouldn't be the Odyssey. That's for sure. It should be the Telemachy. <laughs> well said. Yeah. That's all I had. <laughs> so book two starts with the assembly that uh, Telemachus promised the suitors. Well, this is a blind side. I can't believe that he would do this so unexpectedly. I know. It came out of nowhere. Yeah. Now, the first person to speak of this assembly is actually uh, Aegidius. Now, Aegidius is a wise elder of Ithaca. He's not actually one of the suitors. And he actually praises young Telemachus for stepping up into his father's role and notes that this is actually the first time an assembly has been held since Odysseus, you know, before he left. So he's kind of acknowledging this as a big moment because we haven't done this in 20 years. Big boy pants. Here we go. Yep. So he is praising Telemachus for that already. Now, when Telemachus uh, goes to talk, he gives sort of an impassioned speech where he he laments the loss of his father and of his father's home because the suitors who are the sons of Ithaca's, you know, leaders or, you know, were or former leaders, the, the men who went to Troy to fight with Odysseus have taken over their home and he rebukes them for consuming his father's oxen and sheep. And as they pursue their courtship day in and day out with Penelope, when a decent man, this is what he says, a decent man will go to Penelope's father, uh, Icarius, and ask him for her hand in marriage. Why would you come here to try to court her? Go talk to her dad. Like, what is wrong with you guys? They also, I believe, they sacrificed his animals, too, yeah. to the gods. They not only are eating his food, but they're they're using his animals to get favor from the gods yeah <laughs> it's bogus it is it's it's, it's pretty asinine yeah. well after after you know he goes on his spiel about how scummy these guys are well that's when uh antonis he speaks up and he's like hey it's not our fault it's your mom's yeah. <laughs> i can't help but your mom keeps saying no yeah he says this is, he says she seduces every suitor but won't commit to any now she has not seduced any of them <laughs> and this is the point he brings up he reminds the suitors of a ruse that she pulled on him uh, to put off remarrying she claimed to be making a burial shroud for her father-in-law laertes now, as soon as she was done during the day, or, or, or no, she said as soon as she was done making this burial shroud, she would choose a new husband. However, every night she would carefully undo the knitting she did during the day so that the shroud would never be finished. Flawless. <laughs> so uh, Antonis is like, yeah, so it's her fault. She's keeping us here because she won't pick anybody. She promised us. And then he goes on to declare that if she could not choose a husband, that she should just be sent back to her father so that he can choose a new husband. Well, obviously, Telemachus is not going to throw his mother out. He's not going to do it. And this upsets him, and he actually calls upon the gods to punish the suitors. And no sooner does he do that than two eagles start fighting each other right above the assembly. And they're going at it. You know, they're cutting each other with their talons and everything. It's a vicious fight up there. Caw. Precisely. The pterodactyl noise yeah. that Achilles made is You're echoing throughout the You're assembly welcome. in Ithaca. <laughs> I understand how eagles sound. Indeed. Now, there's a soothsayer there named uh, Halitherses. Now, he sees this and he interprets the, the eagle struggle as a sign of Odysseus' imminent return. And he warns the suitors that they will face a massacre if they don't leave. So he kind of hit the nail on the head right there. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's almost like he got divine intervention. Yeah, there. pretty on the nose there. Uh, this guy needs to keep his job. Don't, <laughs> right? Do not get rid of him. Once you realize that this is going to happen, keep him. Okay? Right. Well, of course, the suitors, they all balk at this. And they, they call him foolish. And they're like, oh, whatever. So we're, we're staying here. I don't care what you guys say. God's. I actually hear it in Hector's voice. Birds? I care nothing for birds. Yeah. <laughs> so the assembly kind of ends in a deadlock, pretty much. Telemachus gives them a warning, tells them to leave, and they're like, no. 
Yeah. That's exactly how they say it to you. Your mom is mine. So later, Telemachus begins preparing for his voyage to Pyrrhus and Sparta. You know, he's getting hyped up about it. Yeah. While Athena comes and visits him again, this time he's disguised as Mentor, who is another old friend of Odysseus. And she encourages Telemachus and predicts his journey will be fruitful. Wink, wink, she already knows. So after that, she then sets out to town and she assumes the guise of Telemachus himself in order to collect a loyal crew. So she turns into Telemachus and she's like, you know what? He's not going to be able to do this part. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, he needs a little help. Training wheels are staying on. (laughs) So meanwhile, while she's doing that, the suitors are actually becoming suspicious because they learn of his trip plans. And it says one rude youth says that he's going to Pyros and Sparta to bring back troops to kill us. That's what he's doing. He's I mad, mean, and that's what he's doing. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't roll that out. No, I wouldn't either. Uh, if he doesn't find his daddy, yeah, come back with some Spartans. So another rude youth says, "Well, hopefully he'll get lost at sea like his father, <laughs> <laughs> like father, like son." Am I yeah. Right? <laughs> so let's hope that happens. Well, <laughs> Telemachus he starts getting things ready while Athena's off uh, collecting a crew. And Telemachus, he doesn't tell anyone affiliated with the house that he's planning on leaving. So he doesn't want his mom to find out because he knows that she'll freak out because Odysseus got lost to sea and now he's going to sea. So, you know, that's naturally how a mom's going to react. She's not going to want to see her son do that. Well, the only one that does know is his elderly nurse, uh, Euryclea. Now, (laughs) Euryclea has been his nurse, you know, since he was a baby. So he kind of confides in her, but she pleads with him not to go. But then he kind of puts her at ease and assures her by saying that he knows a god is on his side because he suspects Mentor of being Athena, or at least a god. I don't know if it's Athena that he assumes, but... So after that, Athena returns and forces the suitors to fall asleep. She kind of puts like a sleep spell on them. And while they're asleep, she gets Telemachus and brings him to his ship. And they set sail for Pyrrhus. And that is how book two ends. Uh, yeah. And, but, I mean, was it in the, this book or the next one where she visits Penelope? I can't remember. Uh, Athena. She visits, um, there's that one point where Penelope's uh, weaving and she's crying a little bit. And uh, Athena goes and she placates her with a little bit of magic. Cause, oh, yeah, yeah. That's <clears> this book. <throat> that's this book. Good. That's okay. book two. So, also, th- the cool part about this book is we also inadvertently homer's given us a little bit of uh, a glimpse into their world back then so the the whole point of her weaving this um this burial shroud for her father-in-law he's not dead yet he's still alive <laughs> but it's because as expected of the um one of the sons the wife of one of the sons they're expected as their duty to perform and get this weaved so Odysseus doesn't have any brothers. That part is pretty pretty well established in the books by now because it's never mentioned. Um, so she's the one that should have to do it. If she doesn't do it, he's never going to have it. But one thing that is kind of a, a big reason why this is explained, more so than giving us a glimpse of that world, is think back to what Helen was doing for the first time that we met her in the Iliad. She was weaving with Paris. So with this very key element, we're seeing that she's weaving, but she's not weaving to show that she's the queen of the household or be this ambiguous character. She's weaving for a purpose. She's weaving to try to hold off these suitors. And it's it's with the conniving of an Odysseus-esque plan that she does this. But there's almost, like I said, you, you can feel for Penelope, but at the same time, what she's done to this country because she hasn't handed over the reins to her son is it's led it to stagnation. There's she it's in his speech with his mother. You're not the only one who's lost anything. Look at the state of the kingdom. Look at where we are right now. You know, we've got to do something. You've got to do something here. So she's, she's done some selfish things and um, out of love, but she hasn't fulfilled her end of the duty. And the concept of weaving though, that's going to come up a lot. So you'll see it. Um, in the themes of the actual book. So when it talks about um, Odysseus, you know, it talked about the man of twists and turns in that quote that we read earlier. That's that's there for a reason. 
is that key element. He's constantly spinning his tails. He's mm-hmm. changing his lies. And they, they want you to kind of see that, just the, the continuation of that theme itself. And then you'll also, you'll see with the, we won't get to it probably in this episode, but the the relation between Helen and Menelaus, they're not happy still. They still have this weird relationship where you're like, does is he cool with her? <laughs> does he think that she was cool there? I don't know. Neither does Homer. But, <laughs> we'll say. Yeah. But just kind of keep in mind, anytime you see her mentioned, Helen and Menelaus, it's to fully see, kind of like how anytime that Hector was on a scene, Paris was there to be the, the heel. Helen is her heel. So she's there to see what type of a character that Penelope is. And there's three different characters that for sake of our term of the word Odyssey, fulfill an Odyssey in this story. Honestly, obviously, it can only be Odysseus because he's the only person with the namesake, but Telema- uh, Telemachus gets his, Penelope gets hers, and then obviously Odysseus. And Indeed. maybe maybe even Poseidon. Perhaps. Not Poseidon. No, not Poseidon. <laughs> but that's all I wanted to mention there. All righty. So book three starts with... Uh... Telemachus and Athena arriving in Pyrrhos. Now, remember, Athena is in the guise of mentor still. Now, when they arrive in Pyrrhos, there is actually a great religious ceremony honoring Poseidon happening where dozens of bulls are sacrificed. And when they arrive, Athena kind of she, she, she puts some words of encouragement in the Telemachus and she says, Telemachus, no shyness now. For to accomplish this, you cross the sea to make inquiry for your father and to learn where he lies buried and what fate he met. Go then straight forward to the horseman Nestor and let us know what is the wisdom hidden in his breast. Beg him yourself to tell the very truth. Falsehood he will not speak for just and wise he is. So basically right there she's saying, all right, you're going to be a big boy. I know he's your elder and I know you're nervous, but you're going to have to come at him direct and ask about your father. Don't beat around the bush. So not long after that, you know, they're walking through the ceremony. Uh, they actually run into one of Nestor's sons who leads them to the table that Nestor's sitting at. Now, while at the table, you know, Telemachus, he doesn't beat around the bush. He cuts right to the chase and he says, hey, do you know anything about my father, Odysseus? You know what happened to him? And unfortunately, Nestor, he has really no info on Odysseus. Because what happened was Nestor recounts that Achilles and big Ajax didn't make it out of the battle. Even though Ajax wasn't killed in the battle, you know, it was shortly after. He didn't make yeah. it. And Achilles was killed during the sack. Got them the goats, though. Exactly. He got the goats. <laughs> That's what counts. Yep. Those of you keeping home or keeping score at home, Ajax yeah. the Greater won. Yeah, so he explains that those two, the those two big names, you know, didn't make it out of the war really. And then he goes on to explain that after the fall of Troy, Menelaus and Agamemnon kind of had a little falling out because Menelaus wanted to leave immediately. Agamemnon wanted to stay a day and make sacrifices. Well, Menelaus set sh- set uh, set a shit up ship up. <laughs> Keep it in. Yep. Set his ship up <laughs> to set sail back to Greece, and Nestor accompanied him. Nailed it. And meanwhile, Odysseus decided to stay back with Agamemnon while he made sacrifices for a day. So that is why Nestor does not know Odysseus's whereabouts or his fate. Now, Od- Odysseus uh, joined, like I said, he joined Agamemnon. Nestor hadn't heard any news from him since. But then he also says that, well, he can only pray that Athena will show him the kindness she showed Odysseus. Not knowing that Athena is right next to him. Yeah. He's like, man, you're, you're dad. Not knowing yet, I should yeah. add. He's like, man, you're dad, though. <laughs> I, think Athena, I think Athena wanted the hit. Yeah, that's what he said. In Verbatim. front of her. In so like, many words. And she was like, I'm sorry. What was that? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> with, with that fake. What if she was like, mm, he knows. <laughs> He he knew. He's, He's right. <laughs> with her fake beard on. I'm telling you, I, I'm pretty hyped that I got that Life of Brian uh, reference in there. Uh, that, that, that's, I'm, I'm so hyped. That's right a good one. That's yes. a good one you snuck yep. in there. <laughs> so after that, he he adds something else. He, he adds that he hopes Telemachus will achieve renown in defense of his father as Arrestus did 
once he heard of the suitors taking over the prince's house. Now, Telemachus, he asks, he's like, well, what happened with Orestes? Bum, bum, bum. And Wait. that's that is when Agamemnon's fate is revealed. Wait, we we talked about this in this in this podcast. Mm-hmm. We did. Yeah, but we're gonna talk. Uh, go go over it again, again, real quick. Yeah, here we go. Go over it. <laughs> so Nestor tells him that Orestes is the son of Agamemnon, and when Agamemnon returned from Troy, his wife Clytemnestra had been seduced by a man named uh, Aegisthus, and once Agamemnon arrived, they plotted to kill him, and they did. They murdered him. And then Orestes arrived in his father's defense, and he murdered Aegisthus and his mom, Clytemnestra. So for doing that, he was actually respected and renowned for defending his father's honor. And that is kind of the inspiration he gives to Telemachus. He's like, hey, this is what needs to be done. If this, If that is how it goes down, if these guys are doing that to you, then you got to do what you got to do, man. You know, Orestes did it and everybody loves him for it. Yep. Following his footsteps if you have to. So after he tells him that story, you know, that's that scene that, that stays with Telemachus. He's like, all right, if that's what it comes to, that's what I got to do. That's what Orestes did work for him. So after that, Nestor offers them to stay in his palace instead of their ship. And he also offers his son, Pisistratus, yes, I said that right, <laughs> to accompany them to Sparta because he know you know he's familiar with that route. Now Athena, as mentor right now, respectfully declines, but tells Nestor to have Pisistratus return with Telemachus in the morning, and then she turns into an eagle right there in front of the entire court of Pyrrhus and flies back to the ships to guard him. And that's when the kind of light bulb clicks, and Nestor's like, ah. Hey, I think you might have been with a god. I think you're with a god, so I think you're good to go. Yep. Sounds like, can I just keep my son then? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't say that last part. No, he didn't. Yeah, This part just kind of shows you, Athena's a little bit of a show woman. She, didn't she, have to, she could have walked into an alley and then done it, but no, she's like, Kah! She's, she's like, like, you know what? I, I want you guys to see how dope I yeah. am. <laughs> you, you thought that I liked Odysseus? Just wait. Yeah, I like eagles. Yeah, Kah. <laughs> Turns into an eagle. <laughs> so amazed, Nestor brings Telemachus to his home where they make offerings to the gods. You know, they make some sacrifices. And then he has his daughter bathe Telemachus and supply him with some fresh robes and a comfy place to sleep for the night. And then promptly the next morning, they load their fastest horses to a chariot and uh, Pisistratus and Telemachus take off to the ship, set sail for Sparta. And that is where book three concludes. And that is where we're going to leave you guys off this episode. Yeah, never forget... Just remember what happened and the whole beef with Agamemnon because it just this this was, this was some plotting going on because I don't know if you guys remember this but the father of Agamemnon he got really jealous of um, his brother Atreus and they tried to they fought for the throne um, he ended up having an affair with his wife so Atreus thought that it would be super dope to get even with his brother by feeding him his own children because that's a reasonable reaction mm-hmm. then indeed <laughs> then retaliate a yeah, thousand yeah, fold then, <laughs> then his brother Thyestus decided that the only way that he could get even was if he raped his daughter his own daughter and that's where Aegisthus comes from so man yeah very troubled home yes. he comes from. I mean, it's, I, I, I think you could say the only thing that we're missing is the shepherd babies. You know, yeah. We need to get to the bottom of this, though. I want to find out where the shepherds came with this black market, what they sold these kids for, and I want to get to the bottom of it now. And also, I'm going to remind you guys real quick that Agamemnon was not uh, very saintly. Yes, he was. His wife had a little more reason to kill him than just finding another lover. Before he left for Troy, he sacrificed their daughter. Iphigenia, yeah. Yeah. To the to Artemis. Artemis. Yeah. And yeah, so Clytemnestra, that didn't sit well with her because that was the last thing he did before he left for the yeah. war. I mean, he just he just wanted to help his brother get his wife back. I who guess. may or may not have been there on her own will. We're not sure. Still, We're not sure. It's still very there. ambiguous. It seems like she was a, there against her will, but... You never yeah, know. she. I mean, her. She said she was, but then 
you're gonna find out in the next episode that maybe she wasn't. Who knows? Yeah, it's it's a whole anybody's ordeal. guess. It's yeah, a whole deal. It's a whole war deal. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for continuing to listen to us. Um, we're actually we're getting ready to launch our Patreon page. Yes, um, that'll be a lot of fun. If you guys have any ideas on what you'd like for us to cover, um, just go ahead and hit us up on our Facebook page or our Instagram page. Um, right now, what we're leaning more towards is some of the most outrageous, um, just retelling some of the most outrageous tales of uh, just historical characters. The main reason why we want to do the Patreon is because we're going to get a, a website funded and upgrade some equipment. Um, so any little bit helps us. So yes, appreciate it all, yes, guys. Indeed. Thank you so and much. Like I said, it's gonna, the Patreon is going to be a lot of fun. It will so. be. Look forward to that. Plus, Dustin's a clown. Yes, indeed. <laughs>